The Beast is one of the cornerstones of what makes Grim Hollow such an evocative dark fantasy setting. The Great Beast stalks across the Burak Empire, corrupting and destroying anything in its path. The unknowable nature of the Beast is what makes it conceptually so terrifying, alongside the fact that nobody can stand to be in its presence without losing themselves to mutation and insanity. But this unknowable nature presents a problem for GMs. 5e is a game about heroes overcoming challenges to achieve some form of victory. So how can you run an encounter with a monster that can't even be fought, much less killed? My name is Ben Byrne and this is how you run an encounter with the Great Beast of Etherus. Great Beast is a colossal creature that stands taller than any fortress tower. Its head is an enormous deer skull crowned with many antlers, and it has emaciated, stretched human limbs which reach out across the land as it wanders with an unnatural grace. The beast has an ethereal quality to it, able to appear and disappear within an instant. It is not a thunderous Tarask which tears the landscape up in a singular path of destruction. The beast's corruption appears on the land like patches of mold in an unpredictable pattern. No living creature can withstand the presence of the beast unchanged. Animals and commoners alike are mutated into ghastly aberrations, driven mad by the indisputable truth learned in confronting the beast. We are nothing. Our efforts do not matter and we are all going to die. The beast first appeared after the gods end in Etherus, when the final gods were killed and the world left without divine guidance or light. This has led to many theories about the beast's origin and its link to the divine. Was this creature birthed by the death of the gods? Is it an ancient god itself having waited? patiently in the darkness for an unprotected realm to feast upon? Or is it the ascended state of the last emperor of the Burak Empire, Leopold I, whose insanity was blamed for the god's end and whose life was ended by assassin's blades? Any or all of these origins for the Great Beast could be true in your Grim Hollow campaign. And in truth, the unknowable nature of the beast is what makes it terrifying. Therefore, even if you decide on an answer to the beast's origin as the DM of your adventure, your adventurers should never learn it. But again, this adds to the frustration of running the great beast. What can you do with a monster that the players can't even ascertain the truth behind, let alone confront in battle? The Grim Hollow Player's Guide does give one method for featuring the beast as a consistent mechanical element in your campaign. This is using the influence dice, which are pools of D6s split between the resolve pool and the beast pool. D6s are added to the resolve pool when events occur that would bolster the party's resolve, such as accomplishing a narrative goal, a moment of virtuous sacrifice, or a player demonstrating excellent character roleplay just like they would with gaining inspiration. On the other hand, D6s are added to the beast pool whenever an event happens that darkens the world. An enemy of the party accomplishes a goal. A party member enacts violence against an innocent victim. Or a new and horrific monster is encountered. The influence dice represent the weave of fate through your campaign. Dice from the resolve pool can be used to aid the party, such as providing extra healing or turning a miss attack into a hit during a combat. The dice from the beast pool are used by the GM to increase the difficulty of the campaign, such as making an encounter much harder or turning an NPC against the party with a sense of superstition. Yet the influence dice don't necessarily represent a binary between good actions and evil actions. It's not a choice between Paragon and Renegade, for example. The GM can change the number of dice in the influence pool by offering party members 
dark bargains. For example, you may recover from the disease that you were suffering automatically, but I will remove a dice from the resolve pool. Or your dreams that night are troubled by visions of your enemy. But are these dreams? or are they premonitions? You can find out exactly where your enemy is hiding if I can add two dice to the beast pool. The beast pool is named such because it can be used to represent the beast's insidious influence in your campaign, even when it isn't directly present itself. After all, if the beast is some kind of god, surely it has some form of omnipotence. In fact, when the beast pool reaches six dice in total, the great beast itself itself can manifest near the player's location. And if that were to happen, how would you run such an encounter? before I get to how I would stage a direct confrontation with the Great Beast itself, I want to review a few other monsters your party may encounter as servants or victims of the Beast's presence. Because in the Grim Hollow books, it is advised that you create encounters with monsters created by the Beast rather than with the Beast itself. And I think that this is great advice anytime you don't want your campaign to potentially end. There are several monsters within the monster grimoire who have explicit ties to the great beast, but I also want to mention a few others that are my favorites to use as well. In Grim Hollow, gnolls are not a naturally occurring species. They are humanoids that have been transformed by the beast into jackal-like monsters, capable of throwing poison spines like darts, which they snap from their own body. Hunger-cursed carnivores are similarly affected animals. The beast's presence could potentially create a carnivorous bull or a hypnotic three-eyed horse. Rugals are larger aberrant bruises that were once humanoid and might present a challenge to a mid-tier party. Kuroks are similarly beast-cursed dwarves that have become fused with their armor and stone and make for honestly terrifying encounters in the tight, dark spaces from a dwarven mine. Grotesqueries are aberrant treants or dryads that may have been affected by the beast's power. They are a higher CR monster that could have blights or cursed beasts or even fey creatures as their servants. And an entire monster hunting quest could revolve around destroying a grotesquery. Caprathorns are a particularly dangerous threat at CR 21. They have the ability to entomb downed party members to stop them from being able to be healed and throw out fields of rippling energy that annihilate creatures rather than ever allowing for death saving throws. Caprathorns could act as an avatar for the Great Beast, a, a climactic boss battle if you wanted. Maybe they're at the center of a doomsday cult the party are trying to dismantle before this cult is able to summon the Great Beast itself. All these stat blocks are in the Grim Hollow Monster Grimoire, but you could also use basically any of your favorite aberrations stat blocks from any monster manual that you might own for 5th edition. Gibbering Mouthers, Wandering Grell, or even a Mind Flayer could be introduced into Grim Hollow. Maybe the Mind Flayer is a singular creature, a cultist priest that has been blessed by the beast. And of course, basically any aberrant stat block from this book, Dungeons of Drakenheim, is golden for representing minions of the beast. And I'm gonna talk more about this book in a minute. All right, all right, let's stop dancing around the issue and discuss how you could run a direct encounter with the great beast itself in a campaign which centers upon it. And this does come with a quick disclaimer that it will not end entirely well for your party. This is potentially a campaign ending encounter, but let's humor ourselves. <laughs> 
A moment ago, I introduced you to The Dungeons of Drakenheim, which is published by Ghostfire Gaming, but it was written by Monty Martin and Kelly McLaughlin, uh, the Dungeon Dudes. In Drakenheim, there are rules for aberrant mutations inflicted on adventurers contaminated by the magic of delirium, which is a precious stone from that campaign setting. But for Grim Hollow, we're going to use these rules a little differently to represent the power of the beast. Your party has been invited to a private dinner with a local baron to thank you for destroying a bandit ring. You attend the dinner at his large manor, his dining hall featuring large windows that look out over his village and the dusky forest beyond. During proceedings, through the window, you see a colossal shape rise above the tree line like a black cloud and hear the trumpeting call of the great beast. Your host and his servants instantly burst into horrifying shapes, their flesh turned to liquid and reforming into slobbering messes of bone, tentacle and bulbous postules. Every party member must succeed a DC 21 con constitution saving throw or instantly take a level of contamination from Dungeons of Drakenheim. Each level of contamination can add mutations that have mechanical buffs or debuffs that will be added instantly to your character. Your host's aberrant remains attack you and the party are instantly thrust into a combat encounter, simultaneously hearing screams from the village below as chaos breaks out, watching the the great beast stalk closer from the forest. At the end of the combat, each party member must then make another DC 21 constitution saving throw or suffer another level of contamination. And this doesn't stop. The Baron's Manor, the village beyond, and the forest outside all become a dungeon that the party must escape. And quickly, because every so often, perhaps at hidden checkpoints that you decide upon as the GM, they'll repeat the constitution saving throw and risk mutating further. Drakenheim has six levels of contamination, each adding further mutations before a character is irrevocably changed into an aberrant monster and that party member is effectively slain. Can the party escape before half of them lose their minds entirely and attack the others? You could let players use aberrant stat blocks from Drakenheim, such as the Protean Abomination, the aberrant horrors from the Monster Grimoire, or just a gibbering mouther from the Monster Manual. The closer the party come to the Great Beast itself, if they would be foolish enough to run in the opposite direction, the more frequently the constitution checks should be made until the party are basically making them at the start of every round. The further the party can escape from the beast, the less frequently they must check against contamination. And escape ought to be the goal because the beast cannot be fought. Running at the beast is like running at the horizon. It gets larger the closer you get until it blacks out the sun, but you can never stand at its feet. Otherwise, it might teleport around like it's phasing in and out of existence. If you don't have the Dungeons of Drakenheim contamination rules, you could use the unstable mutation table and other random boons and flaws from the aberrant transformation for mutation effects in instead, which is in the Grim Hollow campaign guide. Or you could also use the sanity rules on page 259 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to represent the beast's effects on the mind. Maybe even taking a few of those uh, madness rules and shuffling those in among the possible mutation effects. This entire scenario could play out as a higher level one shot, as a prelude to a proper Burak set campaign, demonstrating to players firsthand the power of the great beast. And if any player characters survive that one shot, they could become NPCs for the main campaign. Just noting, this is a potentially TPK-like scenario and almost certain to result in at least some character deaths if they're not cripplingly mutated. For survivors, 
you could set them on a quest to find a holy person capable of casting heal, which removes contamination in Dungeons of Drakenheim, or you could treat their mutations like states of exhaustion, like they will lose them slowly and those mutations will reverse over the course of long rests the longer they spend away from the beast's presence. Or you could reconstitute those mutations so that every affected party member now has the aberration mutation from the campaign guide permanently. That answers how you could feature an encounter with the Great Beast and make it a real presence in your 5e game. But if the player characters can't hope to kill the Great Beast, what is their goal in the campaign? Well, we're going to discuss that in our next video, which is coming next year. In the meanwhile, you can discover more ideas for running a dark fantasy campaign from this video about including Sangromancy, the school of blood magic in your 5e game, or you can learn how to make zombies and corporeal undead truly horrifying in your game by not using them by clicking on this video.